Following a Match by Stephen Leacock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Selvin. Borrowing a Match by Stephen Leacock. You might think that borrowing a match upon the street is a simple thing, but any man who has ever tried it will assure you that it is not, and will be prepared to swear to the truth of my experience of the other evening. I was standing on the corner of the street with the cigar that I wanted to light. I had no match. I waited till a decent, ordinary-looking man came along. Then I said, Excuse me, sir, but could you oblige me with the loan of a match? A match, he said. Why, certainly. Then he unbuttoned his overcoat and put his hand in the pocket of his waistcoat. I know I have one, he went on, and I'd almost swear it's in the bottom pocket. Or, hold on, though so I guess it might be in the top. Just wait till I put these parcels down on the sidewalk. Oh, don't trouble, I said. It's really of no consequence. Oh, it's no trouble. I'll have it in a minute. I know. There must be one in here somewhere. He was digging his fingers into his pockets as he spoke. But you see, this isn't the waistcoat I generally... I saw the man was getting excited about it. Well, never mind, I protested. If that isn't the waistcoat that you generally, why, it doesn't matter. Hold on now, hold on, the man said. I've got one of the ghost things in here somewhere. I guess it must be in with my watch. No, it's not there either. Wait. So I try my coat. If that confounded tailor only knew enough to make a pocket so that a man could get at it. He was getting pretty well worked up now. He had thrown down his walking stick and was plunging at his pockets with his deep set. A that cursed young boy of mine. He hissed. This comes of his falling in my pockets. My God. Perhaps I won't warm him up when I get home. Say, I'll bet that it's in my hip pocket. You just hold up the tail of my overcoat a second till I... No, no, I protested again. Please don't take all this trouble. It really doesn't matter. I'm sure you needn't take off your overcoat. And oh, pray, don't throw away your letters and things in the snow like that and tear out your pockets by the roots. Please, please, don't trample over your overcoat and put your feet through the parcels. I do hate to hear you swearing at a little boy with that peculiar whine in your voice. Don't, please don't tear your clothes so savagely. Suddenly, the man gave a grunt of exultation and drew his hand up from inside the lining of his coat. I've got it, he cried. Here you are. Then he brought it out under the light. It was a toothpick. Yielding to the impulse of the moment, I pushed him under the wheels of a trolley car and ran. End of Borrowing a Match By Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com. Coward by Guy de Maupassant In society he was called Handsome Signot. His name was Vicom Gontran Joseph de Signot. An orphan and possessed of an ample fortune, he cut quite a dash, as it is called. He had an attractive appearance and manner, could talk well, had a certain inborn elegance, an air of pride and nobility, a good moustache, and a tender eye that always finds favor with women. He was in great request at receptions, waltzed to perfection, 
and was regarded by his own sex with that smiling hostility accorded to the popular society man. He had been suspected of more than one love affair, calculated to enhance the reputation of a bachelor. He lived a happy, peaceful life, a life of physical and mental well-being. He won considerable fame as a swordsman, and still more as a marksman. When the time comes for me to fight a duel, he said, I shall choose pistols. With such a weapon I am sure to kill my man. One evening, having accompanied two women friends of his with their husbands to the theatre, he invited them to take some ice cream at Tortoni's after the performance. They had been seated a few minutes in the restaurant when Signor noticed that a man was staring persistently at one of the ladies. She seemed annoyed and lowered her eyes. At last she said to her husband, There's a man over there looking at me. I don't know him. Do you? The husband, who had noticed nothing, glanced across at the offender and said, No, not in the least. His wife continued, half smiling, half angry. It's very tiresome. He quite spoils my ice cream. The husband shrugged his shoulders. Nonsense. Don't take any notice of him. If we were to bother our heads about all the ill-mannered people, we should have no time for anything else. But the VCOM abruptly left his seat. He could not allow this insolent fellow to spoil an ice for a guest of his. It was for him to take cognizance of the offense, since it was through him his friends had come to the restaurant. He went across to the man and said, Sir, you are staring at those ladies in a manner I cannot permit. I must ask you to desist from your rudeness. The other replied, Let me alone, will you? Take care, sir, said the vicom between his teeth, or you will force me to extreme measures. The man replied with a single word, a foul word, which could be heard from one end of the restaurant to the other, and which startled every one there. All those whose backs were toward the two disputants turned round. All the others raised their heads. Three waiters spun round on their heels like tops. The two lady cashiers jumped as if shot, then turned their bodies simultaneously, like two automata worked by the same spring. There was a dead silence, then suddenly a sharp, crisp sound. The VCOM had slapped his adversary's face. Everyone rose to interfere. Cards were exchanged. When the VCOM reached home, he walked rapidly up and down his room for some minutes. He was in a state of too great agitation to think connectedly. One idea alone possessed him, a duel. But this idea roused in him as yet no emotion of any kind. He had done what he was bound to do. He had proved himself to be what he ought to be. He would be talked about, approved, congratulated. He repeated aloud, speaking as one does when under the stress of great mental disturbance. What a brute of a man! Then he sat down and began to reflect. He would have to find seconds as soon as morning came. Whom should he choose? He bethought himself of the most influential and best-known men of his acquaintance. His choice fell at last on the Marquis de la Tenor and Colonel Bourdin, a nobleman and a soldier. That would be just the thing. Their names would carry weight in the newspapers. He was thirsty, and drank three glasses of water, one after another. Then he walked up and down again. If he showed himself brave, determined, prepared to face a duel in deadly earnest, his adversary would probably draw back and proffer excuses. He picked up the card he had taken from his pocket and thrown on the table. He read it again, as he had already read it, first at a glance in the restaurant, and afterward on the way home in the light of each gas lamp. Georges Lamille, 51 Rue Monse. That was all. He examined closely this collection of letters, which seemed to him mysterious, fraught with many meanings. Georges Lamille, who was the man? What was his profession? Why had he stared so at a woman? Was it not monstrous that a stranger, an unknown, should thus all at once upset one's whole life, simply because it pleased him to stare rudely at a woman? And the VCOM once more repeated aloud, What a brute! Then he stood motionless, thinking, his eyes still fixed on the card. Anger rose in his heart against this scrap of paper, a resentful anger, mingled with a strange sense of uneasiness. It was a stupid business altogether. He took up a penknife which lay open within reach, and deliberately struck it into the middle of the printed name, as if he were stabbing someone. So he would have to fight, should he choose swords or pistols, for he considered himself as the insulted party. With the sword he would risk less, but with the pistol there was some chance of his adversary backing out. A duel with swords is rarely fatal, since mutual prudence prevents the combatants from fighting close enough to each other for a point to enter very deep. 
With pistols he would seriously risk his life, but, on the other hand, he might come out of the affair with flying colors, and without a duel after all. I must be firm, he said. The fellow will be afraid. The sound of his own voice startled him, and he looked nervously round the room. He felt unstrung. He drank another glass of water, and then began undressing, preparing to going to bed. As soon as he was in bed he blew out the light and shut his eyes. I have all day tomorrow, he reflected, for setting my affairs in order. I must sleep now, in order to be calm when the time comes. He was very warm in bed, but could not succeed in losing consciousness. He tossed and turned, remained for five minutes lying on his back, then changed to his left side, then rolled over to his right. He was thirsty again, and rose to drink. Then a qualm seized him. Can it be possible I am afraid? Why did his heart beat so uncontrollably at every well-known sound in his room? When the clock was about to strike, the prefatory grating of its spring made him start, and for several seconds he panted for breath, so unnerved was he. He began to reason with himself on the possibility of such a thing. Could I, by any chance, be afraid? No, indeed, he could not be afraid, since he was resolved to proceed to the last extremity, since he was irrevocably determined to fight without flinching. And yet he was so perturbed in mind and body that he asked himself, Is it possible to be afraid in spite of oneself? And this doubt, this fearful question took possession of him. If an irresistible power, stronger than his own will, were to quell his courage, what would happen? He would certainly go to the place appointed. His will could force him that far. But supposing, when there, he were to tremble or faint. And he thought of his social standing, his reputation, his name. And he suddenly determined to get up and look at himself in the glass. He lighted his candle. When he saw his face reflected in the mirror, he scarcely recognized it. He seemed to see before him a man whom he did not know. His eyes looked disproportionately large, and he was very pale. He remained standing before the mirror. He put out his tongue as if to examine the state of his health, and all at once the thought flashed into his mind, at this time the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. And his heart throbbed painfully, at this time the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. This person in front of me, this I whom I see in the glass will perhaps be no more. What, here I am, I look at myself, I feel myself to be alive, and yet in twenty-four hours I may be lying on that bed, with closed eyes, dead, cold, inanimate. He turned round, and could see himself distinctly lying on his back on the couch he had just quitted. He had the hollow face and the limp hands of death. Then he became afraid of his bed, and to avoid seeing it went to his smoking room. He mechanically took a cigar, lighted it, and began walking back and forth. He was cold. He took a step toward the bell, to wake his valet, but stopped with hand raised toward the bell rope. He would see that I am afraid. And, instead of ringing, he made a fire himself. His hands quivered nervously as they touched various objects. His head grew dizzy, his thoughts confused, disjointed, painful. A numbness seized his spirit, as if he had been drinking. And all the time he kept on saying, What shall I do? What will become of me? His whole body trembled spasmodically. He rose, and going to the window, drew back the curtains. The day, a summer day, was breaking. A pink sky cast a glow on the city, its roofs and its walls. A flush of light enveloped the awakening world, like a caress from the rising sun and the glimmer of dawn kindled a new hope in the breast of the vicom. What a fool he was to let himself succumb to fear before anything was decided, before his seconds had interviewed those of George A. Lamille, before he even knew whether he would have to fight or not. He bathed, dressed, and left the house with a firm step. He repeated as he went, I must be firm, very firm. I must show that I am not afraid. His seconds, the Marquis and the Colonel, placed themselves at his disposal and, having shaken him warmly by the hand, began to discuss details. "'You want a serious duel?' asked the colonel. "'Yes, quite serious,' replied the vicom. "'You insist on pistols?' put in the marquis. "'Yes.' "'Do you leave all the other arrangements in our hands?' With a dry, jerky voice, the vicom answered. Twenty paces, at a given signal. The arm to be raised, not lowered. Shots to be exchanged until one or the other is seriously wounded.' 
Excellent conditions, declared the colonel in a satisfied tone. You are a good shot. All the chances are in your favor. And they parted. The VCOM returned home to wait for them. His agitation, only temporarily allayed, now increased momentarily. He felt in arms, legs, and chest a sort of trembling, a continuous vibration. He could not stay still, either sitting or standing. His mouth was parched, and he made every now and then a clicking movement of the tongue, as if to detach it from his palate. He attempted to take luncheon but could not eat. Then it occurred to him to seek courage and drink, and he sent for a decanter of rum, of which he swallowed, one after another, six small glasses. A burning warmth, followed by a deadening of the mental faculties, ensued. He said to himself, I know how to manage. Now it will be all right. But at the end of the hour he had emptied the decanter, and his agitation was worse than ever. A mad longing possessed him to throw himself on the ground, to bite, to scream. Night fell. A ring at the bell so unnerved him that he had not the strength to rise to receive his seconds. He dared not even to speak to them, wish them good day, utter a single word, lest his changed voice should betray him. All is arranged as you wished, said the colonel. Your adversary claimed at first the privilege of the offended part, but he yielded almost at once, and accepted your conditions. His seconds are two military men. Thank you, said the vicom. The marquis added, Please excuse us if we do not stay now, for we have a good deal to see to yet. We shall want a reliable doctor, since the duel is not to end until a serious wound has been inflicted, and you know that bullets are not to be trifled with. We must select a spot near some house to which the wounded party can be carried if necessary. In fact, the arrangements will take us another two or three hours at least. The VCOM articulated for the second time, Thank you. You're all right, asked the colonel. Quite calm. Perfectly calm. Thank you. The two men withdrew. When he was once more alone, he felt as though he should go mad. His servant having lighted the lamps, he sat down at his table to write some letters. When he had traced the top of a sheet of paper the words, This is my last will and testament, he started from his seat, feeling himself incapable of connected thought, of decision in regard to anything. So he was going to fight. He could no longer avoid it. What then possessed him? He wished to fight. He was fully determined to fight. And yet, in spite of all his mental effort, in spite of the exertion of all his willpower, he felt that he could not even preserve the strength necessary to carry him through the ordeal. He tried to conjure up a picture of the duel, his own attitude, and that of his enemy. Every now and then his teeth chattered audibly. He thought he would read, and took down Chateau Villar's rules of dueling. Then he said, Is the other man practiced in the use of the pistol? Is he well known? How can I find out? He remembered Baron de Vaux's book on marksmen, and searched it from end to end. Georges Lemille was not mentioned. And yet, if he were not an adept, would he have accepted without demur such a dangerous weapon in such deadly conditions? He opened a case of Gastine René, which stood on a small table, and took from it a pistol. Next he stood in the correct attitude for firing, and raised his arm. But he was trembling from head to foot, and the weapon shook in his grasp. Then he said to himself, It is impossible. I cannot fight like this. He looked at the little black, death-spitting hole at the end of the pistol. He thought of dishonor, of the whispers at the club, the smiles in his friends' drawing-rooms, the contempt of women, the veiled sneers of the newspapers, the insults that would be hurled at him by cowards. He still looked at the weapon, and raising the hammer, saw the glitter of the priming below it. The pistol had been left loaded by some chance, some oversight, and the discovery rejoiced him. He knew not why. If he did not maintain, in the presence of his opponent, the steadfast bearing which was so necessary to his honor, he would be ruined forever. He would be branded, stigmatized as a coward, hounded out of society. And he felt, he knew, that he could not maintain that calm, unmoved demeanor. And yet he was brave, since the thought that followed was not even rounded to a finish in his mind. But, opening his mouth wide, he suddenly plunged the barrel of the pistol as far back as his throat, and pressed the trigger. When the valet, alarmed at the report, rushed into the room, he found his master lying dead upon his back. A spurt of blood had splashed the white paper on the table, and had made a great crimson stain beneath the words, This is my last will and testament. End of Coward by Guy de Maupassant 
This recording by James Christopher. JX Christopher at Yahoo.com. The Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Emperor's New Clothes Many years ago there was an emperor, who was so exceedingly fond of new clothes that he spent all his money in dress. He did not trouble himself in the least about his soldiers, nor did he care to go either to the theatre or to the chase, except for the opportunities they afforded him for displaying his new clothes. He had a different suit for each hour of the day, and as of any other king or emperor, one is accustomed to say, he is sitting in council. It was always said of him, the emperor is sitting in his wardrobe. Time passed merrily in the large town which was his capital. Strangers arrived every day at the court. One day two rogues, calling themselves weavers, made their appearance. They gave out that they knew how to weave stuffs of the most beautiful colors and elaborate patterns, the clothes manufactured from which should have the wonderful property of remaining invisible to everyone who was unfit for the office he held, or who was extraordinarily simple in character. These must indeed be splendid clothes, thought the emperor. Had I such a suit, I might at once find out what men in my realms are unfit for their office, and also be able to distinguish the wise from the foolish. This stuff must be woven for me immediately. And he caused large sums of money to be given to both the weavers, in order that they might begin their work directly. So the two pretended weavers set up two looms, and affected to work very busily though in reality they did nothing at all. They asked for the most delicate silk and the purest gold thread, put both into their own knapsacks, and then continued their pretended work at the empty loom until late in the night. I should like to know how the weavers are getting on with my cloth, said the emperor to himself. After some little time had elapsed he was, however, rather embarrassed when he remembered that a simpleton or one unfit for his office would be unable to see the manufacture. To be sure, he thought he had nothing to risk in his own person, but yet he would prefer to send somebody else to bring the intelligence about the weavers and their work before he troubled himself in the affair. All the people throughout the city had heard of the wonderful property that the cloth was to possess and all were anxious to learn how wise, or how ignorant, their neighbors might prove to be. I will send my faithful old ministers to the weavers, said the emperor at last, after some deliberation. He will be best able to see how the cloth looks, for he is a man of sense, and no one can be more suitable for his office than he is. So the faithful old minister went into the hall, where the knaves were working with all their might at their empty looms. What can be the meaning of this? thought the old man, opening his eyes very wide. I cannot discover the least bit of thread on the looms. However, he did not express his thoughts aloud. The impostors requested him very courteously to be so good as to come nearer their looms and then asked him whether the design pleased him, and whether the colors were not very beautiful, at the same time pointing to the empty frames. The poor old minister looked and looked. He could not discover anything on the looms. For a very good reason, viz., there was nothing there. What? thought he again. Is it possible that I am a simpleton? I have never thought so myself and no one must know it now if I am so. Can it be that I am unfit for my office? No, 
That must not be said either. I will never confess that I could not see the stuff. Well, sir minister, said one of the knaves, still pretending to work, you do not say whether the stuff pleases you. Oh, it is excellent, replied the old minister, looking at the loom through his spectacles. This pattern and the colors, yes, I will tell the emperor without delay how very beautiful I think them. We shall be much obliged to you, said the impostors, and then they named the different colors and described the patterns of the pretended stuff. The old minister listened attentively to their words, in order that he might repeat them to the emperor. And then the knaves asked for more silk and gold, saying that it was necessary to complete what they had begun. However, they put all that was given them into their knapsacks, and continued to work with as much apparent diligence as before at their empty looms. The emperor now sent another officer of his court to see how the men were getting on, and to ascertain whether the cloth would soon be ready. It was just the same with this gentleman as with the minister. He surveyed the looms on all sides, but could see nothing at all but the empty frames. Does not the stuff appear as beautiful to you as it did to my lord the minister? asked the impostors of the emperor's second ambassador, at the same time making the same gestures as before, and talking of the design and colors which were not there. I am certainly not stupid, thought the messenger. It must be that I am not fit for my good profitable office. That is very odd, however. No one shall know anything about it. And accordingly he praised the stuff he could not see, and declared that he was delighted with both colors and patterns. In indeed, please your imperial majesty, said he to his sovereign when he returned. The cloth which the weavers were preparing is extraordinarily magnificent. The whole city was talking of the splendid cloth which the emperor had ordered to be woven at his own expense, and now the emperor himself wished to see the costly manufacture while it was still in the loom. Accompanied by a select number of officers of the court, among them whom were the two honest men who had already admired the cloth, he went to the crafty impostors who, as soon as they were aware of the emperor's approach, went on working more diligently than ever, although they still did not pass a single thread through the looms. Is not the work absolutely magnificent? said the two officers of the crown already mentioned. If your majesty will only be pleased to look down at it. What a splendid design! What glorious colors! And at the same time they pointed to the empty frames, for they imagined that Everyone else could see this exquisite piece of workmanship. How is this? said the emperor to himself. I can see nothing. This is indeed a terrible affair. Am I a simpleton, or am I unfit to be an emperor? That would be the worst thing that could happen. Oh, the cloth is charming, said he aloud. It has my complete approbation and he smiled most graciously, and looked closely at the empty looms, for on no account would he say that he could not see what two of the officers of his court had praised so much. All his retinue now strained their eyes, hoping to discover something on the looms, but they could see no more than the others. Nevertheless, they all exclaimed, Oh, how beautiful! and advised his majesty to have some new clothes made for this splendid material, for the approaching procession. Magnificent, charming, excellent, resounded on all sides, and everyone was uncommonly gay. The emperor shared in the general satisfaction, and presented the impostors with the ribbon of an order of knighthood, to be worn in their buttonholes, and the title of gentlemen weavers. The rogue sat up the whole of the night before the day on which the procession was to take place, and had sixteen lights burning 
so that everyone might see how anxious they were to finish the emperor's new suit. They pretended to roll the cloth off the looms, cut the air with their scissors, and sewed with needles without any thread in them. See, cried they at last, the emperor's new clothes are ready. And now the emperor, with all the grandees of his court, came to the weavers, and the rogues raised their arms as if in the act of holding something up, saying, Here are your majesty's trousers, here is the scarf, here is the mantle. The whole suit is as light as a cobweb. One may fancy that one has nothing at all on when dressed in it. That, however, is the great virtue of this delicate cloth. Uh, yes, indeed, said all the courtiers, although not one of them could see anything of this exquisite manufacture. If your imperial majesty would be graciously pleased to take off your clothes, we will fit on the new suit in front of the looking-glass. The emperor was accordingly undressed and the rogues pretended to array him in his new suit. The emperor turned round from side to side before the looking-glass. Oh, how splendid his majesty looks in his new clothes, and how well they fit! Everyone cried out, What a design! What colors! These are indeed royal robes! The canopy which is to be borne over your majesty in this procession is waiting announced the chief master of ceremonies. I am quite ready, answered the emperor. Do my new clothes fit well? asked he, turning himself round again before the looking-glass, in order that he might appear to be examining his handsome suit. The lords of the bedchamber, who were to carry his majesty's train, felt about on the ground, as if they were lifting up the ends of the mantle, and pretend to be carrying something for they would by no means betray anything like simplicity or unfitness for their office. So now the emperor walked under the high canopy, in the midst of the procession, through the streets of his capital, and all the people standing by and those in the windows cried out, Oh, how beautiful are the emperor's new clothes! What a magnificent train there is to the mantle! and how gracefully the scarf hangs! In short, no one would allow that he could not see these much-admired clothes, because, in doing so, he would have declared himself either a simpleton or unfit for his office. Certainly none of the emperor's various suits had ever made so great an impression as these invisible ones. But the emperor has nothing at all on! said a little child. Listen to the voice of innocence, exclaimed his father, and what the child had said was whispered from one to another. But he has nothing at all But he has nothing at all on. But he has nothing at all on. At last cried out all the people. The emperor was vexed, for he knew that the people were right, but he thought the procession must go on and the lords of the bedchamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding up a train, although in reality there was no train to hold. End of The Emperor's New Clothes Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake A Great Mistake by Stephen Crane, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Italian kept a fruit stand on the corner where he had good aim at the people who came down from the elevated station and at those who went along two thronged streets. He sat most of the day in a backless chair that was placed strategically. There was a babe living hard by, up five flights of stairs, who regarded the Italian as a tremendous being. The babe had investigated this fruit stand, 
It had thrilled him as few things he had met with in his travels had thrilled him. The sweets of the world had laid there in dazzling rows, tumbled in luxurious heaps. When he gazed at this Italian, seated there amid such splendid treasures, his lower lip hung low, and his eyes, raised to the vendor's face, were filled with deep respect, worship, as if he saw omnipotence. The babe came often to this corner. He hovered around the stand and watched each detail of the business. He was fascinated by the tranquility of the vendor, the majesty of power and possession. At times he was so engrossed in his contemplation that people hurrying had to use care to avoid bumping him down. He had never ventured very near to the stand. It was his habit to hang warily about the curb. Even there he resembled a babe who looks unbidden at a feast of gods. One day, however, as the baby was thus staring, the vendor arose, and going along the front of the stand, began to polish oranges with a red pocket handkerchief. The breathless spectator moved across the sidewalk until his small face almost touched the vendor's sleeve. His fingers were gripped in a fold of his dress. At last the Italian finished with the oranges and returned to his chair. He drew a newspaper printed in his language from behind a bunch of bananas. He settled himself in a comfortable position and began to glare savagely at the print. The babe was left face to face with the massed joys of the world. For a time he was a simple worshipper at this golden shrine. Then tumultuous desires began to shake him. His dreams were of conquest. His lips moved. Presently into his head there came a little plan. He sidled nearer, throwing swift and cunning glances at the Italian. He strove to contain his conventional manner, but the whole plot was written upon his countenance. At last he had come near enough to touch the fruit. From the tattered skirt came slowly his small dirty hand. His eyes were still fixed upon the vendor. His features were set, save for the underlip which had a faint fluttering movement. The hand went forward. Elevated trains thundered to the station, and the stairway poured people upon the sidewalks. There was a deep sea roar from feet and wheels going carelessly. None seemed to perceive the babe engaged in a great venture. The Italian turned his paper. Sudden panic smote the babe. His hand dropped, and he gave vent to a cry of dismay. He remained for a moment staring at the vendor. There was evidently a great debate in his mind. His infant intellect had defined this Italian. The latter was undoubtedly a man who would eat babies that provoked him. And the alarm in the babe, when this monarch had turned his newspaper, brought vividly before him the consequences if he were detected. But at this moment the vendor gave a blissful grunt, and tilting his chair against the wall, closed his eyes. His paper dropped unheeded. The babe ceased his scrutiny and again raised his hand. It was moved with supreme caution towards the fruit. The fingers were bent, claw-like, in the manner of a great heart-shaking reed. Once he stopped and chattered convulsively, because the vendor moved in his sleep. The babe, with his eyes still upon the Italian, again put forth his hand, and the rapacious fingers closed over a round bulb and it was written that the Italian should at this moment open his eyes. He glared at the babe a fierce question. Thereupon the babe thrust the round ball behind him, and with a face expressive of the deepest guilt, began a wild but elaborate series of gestures declaring his innocence. The Italian howled. He sprang to his feet, and with three steps overtook the babe. He whirled him fiercely, and took from the little fingers a lemon. End of A Great Mistake This recording is in the public domain.
The Judgment of a Sage by Stephen Crane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A beggar crept wailing through the streets of a city. A certain man came to him there and gave him bread, saying, I give you this loaf because of God's word. Another came to the beggar and gave him bread, saying, Take this loaf, I give it because you are hungry. Now there was a continual rivalry among the citizens of this town as to who should appear to be the most pious man, and the event of the gifts to the beggar made discussion. People gathered in knots and argued furiously to no particular purpose. They appealed to the beggar, but he bowed humbly to the ground as befitting one of his condition, and answered, It is a singular circumstance that the loaves were of one size and of the same quality. How, then, can I decide which of these men gave bread more piously? The people heard of a philosopher who traveled through their country, and one said, Behold, we who give not bread to beggars are not capable of judging those who have given bread to beggars. Let us then consult this wise man. But, said some, perhaps this philosopher, according to your rule that one must have given bread before judging they who give bread, will not be capable. That is an indifferent matter to all truly great philosophers. So they made search for the wise man and in time they came upon him, strolling along at his ease in the manner of philosophers. Oh, most illustrious sage, they cried. Yes, said the philosopher promptly. Oh, most illustrious sage, there are two men in our city, and one gave bread to a beggar, saying, Because of God's word, and the other gave bread to the beggar, saying, Because you are hungry. Now, which of these, O oh great illustrious sage, is the most pious? Eh? said the philosopher. Which of these, O oh most illustrious sage, is the most pious man? My friends, said the philosopher, suavely addressing the concourse, I see that you mistake me for an illustrious sage. I am not he whom you seek. However, I saw a man answering my description pass here some time ago. With speed you may overtake him. Adieu. End of The Judgment of the Sage By Stephen Crane Read by Alan Davis Drake Miracles, a pantoum in prose by H. G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter David Smith. The Man Who Could Work Miracles. It is doubtful whether the gift was innate. For my own part, I think it came to him suddenly. Indeed, until he was thirty, he was a sceptic and did not believe in miraculous powers. And here, since it is the most convenient place, I must mention that he was a little man and had eyes of a hot brown, very erect red hair, a moustache with ends that he twisted up, and freckles. His name was George McWhirter Fotheringay, not the sort of name by any means to lead to any expectation of miracles. And he was Clark at gomshots. He was greatly addicted to assertive argument. It was while he was asserting the impossibility of miracles that he had his first intimation of his extraordinary powers. This particular argument was being held in the bar of the Long Dragon and Toddy Beamish was conducting the opposition by a monotonous but effective, so you say, that drove Mr. Fotheringay to the very limit of his patience. There were present, besides these two, a very dusty cyclist, Landlord Cox, and Miss Maybridge, 
the perfectly respectable and rather portly barmaid of the dragon. Miss Maybridge was standing with her back to Mr. Fotheringay, washing glasses. The others were watching him, more or less amused by the present ineffectiveness of the assertive method. Goaded by the Torres Vedras tactics of Mr. Beamish, Mr. Fotheringay determined to make an unusual rhetorical effort. Looky here, Mr. Beamish, said Mr. Fotheringay. Let us clearly understand what a miracle is. It's something contrary-wise to the course of nature, done by power of will, something that couldn't happen without being specially willed. So you say, said Mr. Beamish, repulsing him. Mr. Fotheringay appealed to the cyclist, who had hitherto been a silent auditor, and received his assent, given with a hesitating cough and a glance at Mr. Beamish. The landlord would express no opinion, and Mr. Fotheringay, returning to Mr. Beamish, received the unexpected concession of a qualified assent to his definition of a miracle. For instance, said Mr. Fotheringay, greatly encouraged, here would be a miracle. That lamp in the natural course of nature couldn't burn like that upsy down, could it, Beamish? You say it couldn't, said Beamish. And you, said Fotheringay, you don't mean to say... Eh? No, said Beamish reluctantly. No, it couldn't. Very well, said Mr. Fotheringay. Then here comes someone as it might be me, along here, and stands as it might be here, and says to that lamp, as I might do, collecting all my will, turn upsy down without breaking, and go on burning steady, and... Hello? It was enough to make anyone say hello. The impossible, the incredible, was visible to them all. The lamp hung inverted in the air burning quietly with its flame pointing down. It was as solid and indisputable as ever a lamp was, the prosaic common lamp of the Long Dragon Bar. Mr. Fotheringay stood with an extended forefinger and the knitted brows of one anticipating a catastrophic smash. The cyclist, who was sitting next to the lamp, ducked and jumped across the bar. Everybody jumped, more or less. Miss Maybridge turned and screamed. For nearly three seconds the lamp remained still. A faint cry of mental distress came from Mr. Fotheringay. I can't keep it up, he said, any longer. He staggered back, and the inverted lamp suddenly flared, fell against the corner of the bar, bounced aside, smashed upon the floor and went out. It was lucky it had a metal receiver or the whole place would have been in a blaze. Mr. Cox was the first to speak and his remark, shorn of needless excrescences, was to the effect that Fotheringay was a fool. Fotheringay was beyond disputing even so fundamental a proposition as that. He was astonished beyond measure at the thing that had occurred. The subsequent conversation threw absolutely no light on the matter so far as Fotheringay was concerned. The general opinion not only followed Mr. Cox very closely, but very vehemently. Everyone accused Fotheringay of a silly trick and presented him to himself as a foolish destroyer of comfort and security. His mind was in a tornado of perplexity. He was himself inclined to agree with them and he made a remarkably ineffectual opposition to the proposal of his departure. He went home, flushed and heated, coat collar crumpled, eyes smarting, and ears red. He watched each of the ten street lamps nervously as he passed it. It was only when he found himself alone in his little bedroom in Church Row that he was able to grapple seriously with his memories of the occurrence and ask, What on earth? happened. He had removed his coat and boots and was sitting on the bed with his hands in his pockets repeating the text of his defence for the seventeenth time. I didn't want the confounded thing to upset. When it occurred to him that at the precise moment he had said the commanding words he had 
inadvertently willed the thing, he said, and that when he had seen the lamp in the air, he had felt that it depended on him to maintain it there without being clear how this was to be done. He had not a particularly complex mind, or he might have stuck for a time at that inadvertently willed embracing as it does the abstrusest problems of voluntary action but as it was the idea came to him with a quite acceptable haziness and from that following as i must admit no clear logical path he came to the test of the experiment he pointed resolutely to his candle and collected his mind though he felt he did a foolish thing be raised up he said but in a second that feeling vanished the candle was raised, hung in the air one giddy moment, and as Mr. Fotheringay gasped, fell with a smash on his toilet table, leaving him in darkness save for the expiring glow of its wick. For a time, Mr. Fotheringay sat in the darkness perfectly still. It did happen after all, he said. How I'm to explain it, I don't know. He sighed heavily and began feeling in his pockets for a match. He could find none, and he rose and groped about the toilet table. I wish I had a match, he said. He resorted to his coat and there was none there, and then it dawned upon him that miracles were possible even with matches. He extended a hand and scowled at it in the dark. Let there be a match in that hand, he said. He felt some light object fall across his palm and his fingers closed upon a match. After several ineffectual attempts to light this, he discovered it was a safety match. He threw it down, and it occurred to him that he might have willed it lit. He did, and perceived it burning in the midst of his toilet table mat. He caught it up hastily and it went out. His perception of possibilities enlarged, and he felt for and replaced the candle in its candlestick. Here, you be lit, said Mr. Fotheringay, and forthwith the candle was flaring, and he saw a little black hole in the toilet cover, with a wisp of smoke rising from it. For a time he stared from this to the little flame and back, and then looked up and met his own gaze in the looking glass. By this help, he communed with himself in silence for a time. How about miracles now, said Mr. Fotheringay at last addressing his reflection. The subsequent meditations of Mr. Fotheringay were of a severe but confused description. So far he could see it was a case of pure willing with him. The nature of his experiences so far disinclined him for any further experiments, at least until he had reconsidered them, but he lifted a sheet of paper and turned a glass of water pink and then green, and he created a snail which he miraculously annihilated, and got himself a miraculous new toothbrush. Somewhere in the small hours he had reached the fact that his willpower must be of a particularly rare and pungent quality, a fact of which he had indeed had inklings before, but no certain assurance. The scare and perplexity of his first discovery was now qualified by pride in this evidence of singularity and by vague intimations of advantage, he became aware that the church clock was striking one, and as it did not occur to him that his daily duties at gomshots might be miraculously dispensed with, he resumed undressing, in order to get to bed without further delay. As he struggled to get his shirt over his head, he was struck with a brilliant idea. Let me be in bed, he said, and found himself so. Undressed, he stipulated and finding the sheets cold, added hastily, and in my nightshirt. Oh! In a nice, soft, woollen nightshirt. Ah! He said with immense enjoyment. And now let me be comfortably asleep. He awoke at his usual hour and was pensive all through breakfast time, wondering whether his overnight experience might not be a particularly vivid dream. At length his mind turned again to cautious experiments, for instance, he had three eggs for breakfast, two his landlady had supplied, good but shoppy. The one was a delicious fresh goose egg, laid, cooked and served by his extraordinary will. 
he hurried off to Gomshots in a state of profound but carefully concealed excitement, and only remembered the shell of the third egg when his landlady spoke of it that night. All day he could do no work because of this astonishing new self-knowledge, but this caused him no inconvenience because he made up for it miraculously in his last ten minutes. As the day wore on, his state of mind passed from wonder to elation, albeit the circumstances of his dismissal from the Long Dragon were still disagreeable to recall, and a garbled account of the matter that had reached his colleagues led to some bandinage. It was evident that he must be careful how he lifted frangible articles, but in other ways his gift promised more and more as it turned over in his mind. He extended, among other things, to increase his personal property by unostentatious acts of creation. He called into existence a pair of very splendid diamond studs and hastily annihilated them again as young Gomshot came across the counting-house to his desk. He was afraid young Gomshot might wonder how he had come by them. He saw quite clearly the gift required caution and watchfulness in its exercise but so far he could judge the difficulties attending upon its mastery would be no greater than those he had already faced in the study of cycling. It was that analogy, perhaps, quite as much as the feeling he would be unwelcome in the Long Dragon, that drove him out after supper into the lane beyond the gasworks to rehearse a few miracles in private. There was possibly a certain want of originality in his attempts, for apart from his willpower, Mr. Fotheringay was not a very exceptional man. The miracle of Moses' rod came to his mind, but the night was dark and unfavourable to the proper control of large, miraculous snakes. Then he recollected the story of Tannhauser that he had read on the back of the Philharmonic programme. That seemed to him singularly attractive and harmless. He stuck his walking stick, a very nice Puna Penang lawyer, into the turf that edged the footpath, and commanded the dry wood to blossom. The air was immediately full of the scent of roses, and by means of a match he saw for himself that this beautiful miracle was indeed accomplished. His satisfaction was ended by advancing footsteps. Afraid of a premature discovery of his powers, he addressed the blossoming stick hastily. Go back! What he meant was, change back, but of course he was confused. The stick receded at a considerable velocity, and incontinently came a cry of anger and a bad word from the approaching person. "'Who are you throwing brambles at, you fool?' cried a voice. "'That got me on the shin.' "'I'm sorry, old chap,' said Mr. Fotheringay, and then, realising the awkward nature of the explanation, caught nervously at his moustache. He saw Winch, one of the three Immering constables, advancing. "'What do you mean by it?' asked the constable. "'Hello, it's you, is it? "'The gent that broke the lamp at the Long Dragon.' "'I don't mean anything by it,' said Mr. Fotheringay. "'Nothing at all.' "'What do you do it for, then?' "'Oh, bother,' said Mr. Fotheringay. "'Bother, indeed. "'Do you know that stick hurt? "'What do you do it for, eh?' For the moment Mr. Fotheringay could not think what he had done it for. His silence seemed to irritate Mr. Winch. "'You've been assaulting the police, young man, this time. That's what you've done.' "'Look here, Mr. Winch,' said Mr. Fotheringay, annoyed and confused. "'I'm sorry. Very. The fact is... "'Well?' He could think of no way but the truth. "'I was working a miracle.' He tried to speak in an off-hand way, but try as he would, he couldn't. Working up? Here, don't you talk rot. Working a miracle, indeed. Miracle? Well, that's downright funny. Why, well, use the chap that don't believe in miracles. Fact is, this is another of your silly conjuring tricks. That's what this is. Now, I tell you... But Mr. Fotheringay never heard what Mr. Winch was going to tell him. He realised he had given himself away, flung his valuable secret to all the winds of heaven. A violent gust of irritation swept him to action. He turned on the constable swiftly and fiercely. Here, he said, I've had enough of this, I have. I'll show you a silly conjuring trick, I will. Go to Hades. Go now. He was alone.
Mr. Fotheringay performed no more miracles that night, nor did he trouble to see what had become of his flowering stick. He returned to the town, scared and very quiet, and went to his bedroom. Lord, he said, it's a powerful gift, an extremely powerful gift. I didn't hardly mean as much as that, not really. I wonder what Hades is like. He sat on the bed, taking off his boots. Struck by a happy thought, he transferred the constable to San Francisco, and without any more interference with normal causation, went soberly to bed. In the night he dreamt of the anger of Winch. The next day Mr. Fotheringay heard two interesting items of news. Someone had planted a most beautiful climbing rose against the elder Mr. Gomshot's private house in the Lullaborough Road, and the river, as far as Rawlings Mill, was to be dragged for Constable Winch. Mr. Fotheringay was abstracted and thoughtful all day, and performed no miracles except certain provisions for Winch, and the miracle of completing his day's work with punctual perfection in spite of all the bee-swarm of thoughts that hummed through his mind and the extraordinary abstraction and meekness of his manner was remarked by several people and made a matter for jesting. For the most part he was thinking of Winch. On Sunday evening he went to chapel, and oddly enough Mr. Maydig, who took a certain interest in occult matters, preached about things that are not lawful. Mr. Fotheringay was not a regular chapel-goer, but the system of assertive scepticism to which I have already alluded was now very much shaken. The tenor of the sermon threw an entirely new light on these novel gifts, and he suddenly decided to consult Mr. Maydig immediately after the service. So soon as that was determined, he found himself wondering why he had not done so before. Mr. Maydig, a lean, excitable man with quite remarkably long wrists and neck, was gratified at a request for a private conversation from a young man whose carelessness in religious matters was a subject for general remark in the town. After a few necessary delays, he conducted him to the study of the manse, which was contiguous to the chapel, seated him comfortably, and, standing in front of a cheerful fire, his legs through a Rhodian arch of shadow on the opposite wall, requested Mr. Fotheringay to state his business. At first Mr. Fotheringay was a little abashed, and found some difficulty in opening the matter. "'You will scarcely believe me, Mr. Maydig, I am afraid,' and so forth, for some time. He tried a question at last, and asked Mr. Maydig his opinion of miracles. Mr. Maydig was still saying, "'Well,' in an extremely judicial tone, when Mr. Fotheringay interrupted again. You don't believe, I suppose, that some common sort of person like myself, for instance, as it might be sitting here now, might have some sort of twist inside him that made him able to do things by his will. It's possible, said Mr. Maydig. Something of the sort, perhaps, it is possible. If I might make free with something here, I think I might show you by a sort of experiment, said Mr. Fotheringay. Now take that tobacco jar on the table, for instance. What I want to know is whether what I'm going to do with it is a miracle or not. Just half a minute, Mr. Maydig, please. He knitted his brows, pointed to the tobacco jar and said, Be a bowl of violets. The tobacco jar did as it was ordered. Mr. Maydig started violently at the change and stood looking from the thaumaturgist to the bowl of flowers. He said nothing. Presently he ventured to lean over the table and smell the violets. They were fresh picked and very fine ones. Then he stared at Mr. Fotheringay again. How did you do that? he asked. Mr. Fotheringay pulled his moustache. Just told it and there you are. Is that a miracle? Or is it black art? Or what is it? What do you think's the matter with me? That's what I want to ask. It's a most extraordinary occurrence. And this day last week I knew no more that I could do things like that than you did. It came quite sudden. 
It's something odd about my will, I suppose, and that's as far as I can see. Is that the only thing? Could you do other things besides that? Lord, yes, said Mr. Fotheringay, just anything. He thought and suddenly recalled a conjuring entertainment he had seen. Here, he pointed. Change into a bowl of fish. No, not there. Change into a glass of... No, not there. Change into a glass bowl full of water with goldfish swimming in it. That's better. You see that, Mr. Maydig? It's astonishing. It's incredible. You are either a most extraordinary... But, no. I could change it into anything, said Mr. Fotheringay. Just anything. Here, be a pigeon, will you? In another moment, a blue pigeon was fluttering round the room and making Mr. Maydig duck every time it came near him. Stop there, will you, said Mr. Fotheringay, and the pigeon hung motionless in the air. I could change it back to a bowl of flowers, he said, and after replacing the pigeon on the table, worked that miracle. I expect you will want your pipe in a bit, he said, and restored the tobacco jar. Mr. Maydig had followed all these later changes in a sort of ejaculatory silence. He stared at Mr. Fotheringay and, in a very gingerly manner, picked up the tobacco jar, examined it, replaced it on the table. Well, was the only expression of his feelings. Now after that it's easier to explain what I came about, said Mr. Fotheringay, and proceeded to a lengthy and involved narrative of his strange experiences beginning with the affair of the lamp in the Long Dragon and complicated by persistent allusions to Winch. As he went on, the transient pride Mr. Maydig's consternation had caused passed away. He became the very ordinary Mr. Fotheringay of everyday intercourse again. Mr. Maydig listened intently, the tobacco jar in his hand, and his bearing changed also with the course of the narrative. Presently, while Mr. Fotheringay was dealing with the miracle of the third egg, the minister interrupted with a fluttering, extended hand. It is possible, he said, it is credible, it is amazing, of course, but it reconciles a number of amazing difficulties. The power to work miracles is a gift, a peculiar quality like genius or second sight. Hitherto it has come very rarely and to exceptional people, but in this case, I have always wondered at the miracles of Mahomet, and at Yogi's miracles, and the miracles of Madame Blavatsky, but of course, yes, it is simply a gift. It carries out so beautifully the arguments of that great thinker, Mr. Maydig's voice sank, His Grace the Duke of Argyle. Here we plumb some profounder law, deeper than the ordinary laws of nature. Yes, yes, go on, go on. Mr. Fotheringay proceeded to tell him of his misadventure with Winch, and Mr. Maydig, no longer overawed or scared, began to jerk his limbs about and interject astonishment. It's this what troubled me most, proceeded Mr. Fotheringay. It's this I'm most mightily in want of advice for. Of course he's at San Francisco, wherever San Francisco may be. But of course it's awkward for both of us, as you'll see, Mr. Maydig. I don't see how he can understand what has happened, and I dare say he's scared and exasperated something tremendous and trying to get at me. I dare say he keeps on starting off to come here. I send him back by a miracle every few hours when I think of it. And of course that's the thing he won't be able to understand. It's bound to annoy him, and of course... If he takes a ticket every time, it will cost him a lot of money. i done the best I could for him, but of course it's difficult for him to put himself in my place. I thought afterwards that his clothes might have got scorched, you know, if Hades is all it's supposed to be, before I shifted him. In that case, I suppose they'd have locked him up in San Francisco. Of course I willed him a new suit of clothes on him directly I thought of it. But you see, I'm already in a deuce of a tangle. Mr. Maydig looked serious. I see you are in a tangle. Yes, it's a difficult position. How you are to end it? He became diffuse and inconclusive. 
However, we'll leave Winch for a little and discuss the larger question. I don't think this is a case of the black art or anything of the sort. I don't think there is any taint of criminality about it at all, Mr. Fotheringay. None whatever, unless you are suppressing material facts. No, it's miracles. Pure miracles. Miracles, if I may say so, of the very highest class. He began to pace the hearth rug and gesticulate while Mr. Fotheringay sat with his arm on the table and his head on his arm, looking worried. I don't see how I'm to manage about Winch, he said. A gift of working miracles, apparently a very powerful gift, said Mr. Maydig. We'll find a way about Winch, never fear. My dear sir, you are a most important man, a man of the most astonishing possibilities. As evidence, for example, and in other ways, the things you may do. Yes, I've thought of a thing or two, said Mr. Fotheringay, but some of the things came a bit twisty. You saw that fish at first, wrong sort of bowl and wrong sort of fish, and I thought I'd ask someone. A proper course, said Mr. Maydig, a very proper course, altogether the proper course. He stopped and looked at Mr. Fotheringay, it's practically an unlimited gift. Let us test your powers, for instance. If they really are all they seem to be. And so, incredible as it may seem, in the study of the little house behind the Congregational Chapel, on the evening of Sunday, November 10th, 1896, Mr. Fotheringay, egged on and inspired by Mr. Maydig, began to work miracles. The reader's attention is specially and definitely called to the date. He will object, probably has already objected, that certain points in this story are improbable, that if any things of the sort already described had indeed occurred, they would have been in all the papers at that time. The details immediately following he will find particularly hard to accept, because among other things they involve the conclusion that he or she, the reader in question, must have been killed in a violent and unprecedented manner more than a year ago. Now a miracle is nothing if not improbable, and as a matter of fact the reader was killed in a violent and unprecedented manner in 1896. In the subsequent course of this story that will become perfectly clear and credible as every right-minded and reasonable reader will admit. But this is not the place for the end of the story, being but little beyond the hither side of the middle, and at first the miracles worked by Mr. Fotheringay were timid little miracles, little things with the cups and parlour fitments, as feeble as the miracles of theosophists, and, feeble as they were, they were received with awe by his collaborator. He would have preferred to settle the winch business out of hand, but Mr. Maydig would not let him. But after they had worked a dozen of these domestic trivialities, their sense of power grew. Their imagination began to show signs of stimulation, and their ambition enlarged. Their first larger enterprise was due to hunger and the negligence of Mrs. Minchin, Mr. Maydig's housekeeper. The meal to which the minister conducted Mr. Fotheringay was certainly ill-laid and uninviting as refreshment for the two industrious miracle workers, but they were seated, and Mr. Maydig was descanting in sorrow rather than in anger upon his housekeeper's shortcomings before it occurred to Mr. Fotheringay that an opportunity lay before him. "'Don't you think, Mr. Maydig,' he said, "'if it isn't a liberty, I... "'My dear Mr. Fotheringay, of course. "'No, I didn't think.' Mr. Fotheringay waved his hand. "'What shall we have?' he said, in a large, inclusive spirit, and, at Mr. Maydig's order, revised the supper very thoroughly. "'As for me,' he said, eyeing Mr. Maydig's selection, "'I am always particularly fond of a tankard of stout and a nice Welsh rarebit, and I'll order that. I ain't much given to burgundy.' And forthwith stout and Welsh rarebit promptly appeared at his command. They sat long at their supper, talking like equals, as Mr. Fotheringay presently perceived, with a glow of surprise and gratification, of all the miracles they would presently do. And by and by, Mr. Maydig, said Mr. Fotheringay, I might perhaps be able to help you in a domestic way. 
don't quite follow, said Mr. Maydy, pouring out a glass of miraculous old burgundy. Mr. Fotheringay helped himself to a second Welsh rarebit out of vacancy, and took a mouthful. I was thinking, he said, I might be able, chum, chum, to work, chum, chum, a miracle with Mrs. Minchin, chum, chum, to make her a better woman. Mr. Maydig put down the glass and looked doubtful. She's... She strongly objects to interference, you know, Mr. Fotheringay, and, as a matter of fact, it's well past eleven and she's probably in bed and asleep. Do you think, on the whole... Mr. Fotheringay considered these objections. I don't see that it shouldn't be done in her sleep. For a time Mr. Maydig opposed the idea, and then he yielded. Mr. Fotheringay issued his orders, and a little less at their ease, perhaps, the two gentlemen proceeded with their repast. Mr. Maydig was enlarging on the changes he might expect in his housekeeper next day, with an optimism that seemed even to Mr. Fotheringay's supper senses a little forced and hectic, when a series of confused noises from upstairs began. Their eyes exchanged interrogations, and Mr. Maydig left the room hastily. Mr. Fotheringay heard him calling up to his housekeeper, and then his footsteps going softly up to her. In a minute or so, the minister returned, his step light, his face radiant. Wonderful, he said, and touching, most touching. He began pacing the hearthrug. A repentance, a most touching repentance, through the crack of the door. Poor woman! A most wonderful change! She must have got up at once. She had got up out of her sleep to smash a private bottle of brandy in her box, and to confess it, too. But this gives us... It opens a most amazing vista of possibilities. If we can work this miraculous change in her... The thing's unlimited, seemingly, said Mr. Fotheringay. And about Mr. Winch altogether unlimited, and from the hearthrug, Mr. Maydig, waving the winch difficulty aside, unfolded a series of wonderful proposals, proposals he invented as he went along. Now what those proposals were does not concern the essentials of this story. Suffice it that they were designed in a spirit of infinite benevolence, the sort of benevolence that used to be called postprandial. Suffice it, too, that the problem of Winch remained unsolved, nor is it necessary to describe how far that series got to its fulfilment. There were astonishing changes. The small hours found Mr. Maydig and Mr. Fotheringay careering across the chilly market square under the still moon in a sort of ecstasy of thaumaturgy. Mr. Maydig, all flap and gesture, Mr. Fotheringay short and bristling and no longer abashed at his greatness. They had reformed every drunkard in the parliamentary division, changed all the beer and alcohol to water. Mr. Maydig had overruled Mr. Fotheringay on this point. They had further greatly improved the railway communication of the place, drained Flinders Swamp, improved the soil of One Tree Hill, and cured the vicar's wart. They were going to see what could be done with the injured pier at South Bridge. The place, gasped Mr. Maydig, won't be the same place tomorrow. How surprised and thankful everyone will be. And just at that moment, the church clock struck three. I say, said Mr. Fotheringay, that's three o'clock. I must be getting back. I've got to be at business by eight. And besides, Mrs. Wim's... We're only beginning, said Mr. Maydig, full of the sweetness of unlimited power. We're only beginning. Think of all the good we're doing, when people wake. But, said Mr. Fotheringay, Mr. Maydig gripped his arm suddenly. His eyes were bright and wild. My dear chap, he said, there's no hurry. Look, he pointed to the moon at the zenith. Joshua. Joshua, said Mr. Fotheringay. Joshua! said Mr. Maydig. Why not? Stop it! Mr. Fotheringay looked at the moon. That's a bit tall, he said after a pause. Why not? said Mr. Maydig. Of course it doesn't stop. You stop the rotation of the earth, you know. Time stops. It isn't as if we were doing harm. 
Hmm, said Mr. Fotheringay. Well, he sighed, I'll try. Here. He buttoned up his jacket and addressed himself to the habitable globe, with as good an assumption of confidence as lay in his power. Just stop rotating, will you? said Mr. Fotheringay. Incontinently, he was flying head over heels through the air at the rate of dozens of miles a minute. In spite of the innumerable circles he was describing per second, he thought, for thought is wonderful, sometimes as sluggish as flowing pitch, sometimes as instantaneous as light. He thought in a second, and willed, let me come down safe and sound. Whatever else happens, let me come down safe and sound. He willed it only just in time, for his clothes, heated by his rapid flight through the air, were already beginning to singe. He came down with a forceful but by no means injurious bump in what appeared to be a mound of fresh turned earth, a large mass of metal and masonry, extraordinary like the clock tower in the middle of the market square, hit the earth near him ricocheted over him and flew into stonework, bricks and cement like a bursting bomb. A hurtling cow hit one of the larger blocks and smashed like an egg. There was a crash that made all the most violent crashes of his past life seem like the sound of falling dust, and this was followed by a descending series of lesser crashes. A vast wind roared throughout earth and heaven, so that he could scarcely lift his head to look. For a while he was too breathless and astonished even to see where he was or what had happened, and his first movement was to feel his head and reassure himself that his streaming hair was still his own. Lord, gasped Mr. Fotheringay, scarce able to speak for the gale. I've had a squeak. What's gone wrong? Storms and thunder, and only a minute ago a fine night. It's made it set me on to this sort of thing. What a wind! If I go on fooling in this way, I'm bound to have a thundering accident. Where's Maydig? What a confounded mess everything's in. He looked about him so far as his flapping jacket would permit. The appearance of things was really extremely strange. The sky's all right, anyhow said Mr. Fotheringay, and that's about all that is all right. And even there it looks like a terrific gale coming up. But there's the moon overhead, just as it was just now, bright as midday. But as for the rest, where's the village? Where's... where's anything? And what on earth set this wind a-blowing? I didn't order no wind. Mr. Fotheringay struggled to get to his feet, and after one failure remained on all fours, holding on. He surveyed the moonlit world to leeward, with the tails of his jacket streaming over his head. There's something seriously wrong, said Mr. Fotheringay. And what it is, goodness knows. Far and wide, nothing was visible in the white glare through the haze of dust that drove before a screaming gale. The tumbled masses of earth and heaps of inchoate ruins, no trees, no houses, no familiar shapes, only a wilderness of disorder, vanishing at last into the darkness beneath the whirling columns and streamers. The lightnings and thunderings of a swiftly rising storm. Near him, in the livid glare, was something that might once have been an elm tree, a smashed mass of splinters, shivered from boughs to base and further a twisted mass of iron girders, only too evidently the viaduct, rose out of the piled confusion. You see, when Mr. Fotheringay had arrested the rotation of the solid globe, he had made no stipulation concerning the trifling movables upon its surface, and the earth spins so fast that the surface at its equator is travelling at rather more than a thousand miles an hour and in these latitudes at more than half that pace, so that the village and Mr. Maydig and Mr. Fotheringay and everybody and everything had been jerked violently forward at about nine miles per second, that is to say very much more violently than if they had been fired out of a cannon, 
and every human being, every living creature, every house and every tree, all the world as we know it, had been so jerked and smashed and utterly destroyed. That was all. These things Mr. Fotheringay did not, of course, fully appreciate, but he perceived that his miracle had miscarried, and with that a great disgust of miracles came upon him. He was in darkness now, for the clouds had swept together and blotted out his momentary glimpse of the moon, and the air was full of fitful, struggling, tortured wraiths of hail. A great roaring of wind and waters filled earth and sky, and peering under his hand through the dust and sleet to windward, he saw by the play of the lightnings a vast wall of water pouring towards him. Maydig! screamed Mr. Fotheringay's feeble voice amid the elemental uproar. Here, Maydig! Stop! cried Mr. Fotheringay to the advancing water. Oh, for goodness sake, stop! Just a moment, said Mr. Fotheringay to the lightnings and thunder. Stop just a moment while I collect my thoughts. And now what shall I do? he said. What shall I do? Lord, I wish Maydig was about. I know, said Mr. Fotheringay, and for goodness sake, let's have it right this time. He remained on all fours, leaning against the wind, very intent to have everything right. Ah, he said, let nothing what I'm going to order happen until I say off. Lord, I wish I'd thought of that before. He lifted his little voice against the whirlwind, shouting louder and louder in the vain desire to hear himself speak. Now then, here goes. Mind about that what I said just now. In the first place, when all I've got to say is done, let me lose my miraculous power. Let my will become just like anybody else's will, and all these dangerous miracles be stopped. I don't like them. I'd rather I didn't work them, ever so much. That's the first thing. And the second is, let me be back just before the miracles begin. Let everything be just as it was before that blessed lamp turned up. It's a big job, but it's the last. Have you got it? No more miracles, everything as it was. Me back in the long dragon just before I drank my half pint. That's it, yes. He dug his fingers into the mould, closed his eyes and said, Off! Everything became perfectly still. He perceived that he was standing erect. So you say, said a voice. He opened his eyes. He was in the bar of the Long Dragon, arguing about miracles with Toddy Beamish. He had a vague sense of some great thing forgotten, but instantaneously passed. You see that, except for the loss of his miraculous powers, everything was back as it had been. His mind and memory, therefore, were now just as they had been at the time when this story began, so that he knew absolutely nothing of all that is told here knows nothing of all that is told here to this day, and among other things, of course, he still did not believe in miracles. I tell you that miracles, properly speaking, can't possibly happen, he said, whatever you like to hold, and I'm prepared to prove it up to the hilt. That's what you think, said Toddy Beamish, and prove it if you can. Looky here, Mr. Beamish, said Mr. Fotheringay, let us clearly understand what a miracle is. It's something contrariwise to the course of nature done by the power of will. End of The Man Who Could Work Miracles by H.G. Wells Recording by Peter David Smith www.artmovingon.blogspot.com This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. My Platonic Sweetheart by Mark Twain Note. Mark Twain was always interested in those psychic phenomena which we call dreams. His own sleep fancies were likely to be vivid, and it was his habit to recall them and to find interest and sometimes amusement in their detail. In the story which follows he set down, and not without some fidelity to circumstance, dream circumstance. 
a phase of what we call recurrent dreams. As the tale progressed, he felt an inclination to treat the subject more fully, more philosophically, and eventually he laid the manuscript away. The time did not come when he was moved to rewrite it, and for the pure enjoyment of it as a delicate fancy, it may be our good fortune that he left it unchanged. A. B. P. I met her first when I was seventeen and she fifteen. It was in a dream. No, I did not meet her. I overtook her. It was in a Missourian village, which I had never been in before, and was not in at that time, except dreamwise. In the flesh I was on the Atlantic seaboard, ten or twelve hundred miles away. The thing was sudden and without preparation, after the custom of dreams. There I was, crossing a wooden bridge that had a wooden rail and was untidy with scattered wisps of hay, and there she was, five steps in front of me. Half a second previously neither of us was there. This was the exit of the village which lay immediately behind us. Its last house was the blacksmith shop, and the peaceful clinking of the hammers, a sound which nearly always seems remote and is always touched with a spirit of loneliness, and a feeling of soft regret for something, you don't know what, was wafted to my ear over my shoulder. In front of us was the winding country road, with woods on one side, and on the other a rail fence with blackberry vines and hazel bushes crowding its angles. On an upper rail a bluebird, and scurrying toward him along the same rail a fox squirrel with his tail bent high like a shepherd's crook. Beyond the fence a rich field of grain, and far away a farmer in shirt-sleeves and straw hat wading knee-deep through it no other representative of life, and no noise at all. Everywhere a Sabbath stillness. I remember it all, and the girl, too, and just how she walked, and how she was dressed. In the first moment I was five steps behind her. In the next one I was at her side, without either stepping or gliding. It merely happened. The transfer ignored space. I noticed that, but not with any surprise. It seemed a natural process. I was at her side. I put my arm around her waist and drew her close to me, for I loved her. And although I did not know her, my behavior seemed to me quite natural and right, and I had no misgivings about it. She showed no surprise, no distress, no displeasure, but put an arm around my waist and turned up her face to mine with a happy welcome in it and when I bent down to kiss her and she received the kiss, as if she was expecting it, and as if it was quite natural for me to offer it and her to take it and have pleasure in it. The affection which I felt for her and which she manifestly felt for me was a quite simple fact, but the quality of it was another matter. It was not the affection of brother and sister. It was closer than that, more clinging, more endearing, more reverent and it was not the love of sweethearts, for there was no fire in it. It was somewhere between the two, and was finer than either, and more exquisite, more profoundly contenting. We often experience this strange and gracious thing in our dream loves, and we remember it as a feature of our childhood loves, too. We strolled along across the bridge and down the road, chatting like the oldest friends. She called me George and that seemed natural and right, though it was not my name. And I called her Alice, and she did not correct me, though without doubt it was not her name. Everything that happened seemed just natural and to be expected. Once I said, "'What a dear little hand it is!' and without any words she laid it gratefully in mine for me to examine it. I did it, remarking upon its littleness, its delicate beauty, and its satin skin, then kissed it. She put it up to her lips without saying anything, and kissed it in the same place. Around a curve of the road, at the end of half a mile, we came to a log house, and entered it, and found the table set and everything on it steaming hot, a roast turkey, corn in the ear, butter beans, and the rest of the usual things, and a cat curled up asleep in a splint-bottomed chair by the fireplace, but no people, just emptiness and silence. 
She said she would look in the next room if I would wait for her. So I sat down, and she passed through a door, which closed behind her with a click of the latch. I waited and waited. Then I got up and followed, for I could not any longer bear to have her out of my sight. I passed through the door and found myself in a strange sort of cemetery, a city of innumerable tombs and monuments, stretching far and wide on every hand, and flushed with pink and gold lights flung from the sinking sun. I turned around, and the log-house was gone. I ran here and there and yonder down the lanes between the rows of tombs calling Alice, and presently the night closed down, and I could not find my way. Then I woke, in deep distress over my loss, and was in my bed in Philadelphia, and I was not seventeen now, but nineteen. Ten years afterward, in another dream, I found her. I was seventeen again, and she was still fifteen. I was in a grassy place in the twilight deeps of a magnolia forest some miles above Natchez, Mississippi. The trees were snowed over with great blossoms, and the air was loaded with their rich and strenuous fragrance. The ground was high, and through a rift in the wood a burnished patch of the river was visible in the distance. I was sitting on the grass, absorbed in thinking, when an arm was laid around my neck, and there was Alice sitting by my side and looking into my face. A deep and satisfied happiness and an unwordable gratitude rose in me, but with it there was no feeling of surprise, and there was no sense of a time-lapse. The ten years amounted to hardly even a yesterday, indeed to hardly even a noticeable fraction of it. We dropped in the tranquillest way into affectionate caressings and pettings, and chatted along without a reference to the separation, which was natural, for I think we did not know there had been any that one might measure with either clock or almanac. She called me Jack, and I called her Helen, and those seemed the right and proper names, and perhaps neither of us suspected that we had ever borne others, or if we did suspect it, it was probably not a matter of consequence. She had been beautiful ten years before. She was just as beautiful still, girlishly young and sweet and innocent, and she was still that now. She had had blue eyes, a hair of flossy gold before. She had black hair now, and dark brown eyes. I noted these differences, but they did not suggest change. To me she was the same girl she was before, absolutely. It never occurred to me to ask what became of the log-house. I doubt if I even thought of it. We were living in a simple and natural and beautiful world where everything that happened was natural and right, and was not perplexed with the unexpected or with any forms of surprise, and so there was no occasion for explanations and no interest attaching to such things. We had a dear and pleasant time together, and were like a couple of ignorant and contented children. Helen had a summer hat on. She took it off presently, and said, "'It was in the way. Now you can kiss me better.' It seemed to me merely a bit of courteous and considered wisdom, nothing more, and a natural thing for her to think of and do. We went wandering through the woods, and came to a limpid and shallow stream, a matter of three yards wide. She said, "'I must not get my feet wet, dear. Carry me over.' I took her in my arms and gave her my hat to hold. This was to keep my own feet from getting wet. I did not know why this should have that effect. I merely knew it, and she knew it, too. I crossed the stream and said I would go on carrying her, because it was so pleasant, and she said it was pleasant to her, too, and wished we had thought of it sooner. It seemed to me a pity that we should have walked so far, both of us on foot, when we could have been having this higher enjoyment, and I spoke of it regretfully, as a something lost which could never be got back. She was troubled about it, too, and said there must be some way to get it back, and she would think. After musing deeply a little while, she looked up radiant and proud, and said she had found it. "'Carry me back, and start over again.' I can see now that that was no solution, but at the time it seemed luminous with intelligence, and I believed that there was not another little head in the world that could have worked out that difficult problem with such swiftness and success. I told her that, and it pleased her, and she said she was glad it all happened, so that I could see how capable she was. After thinking a moment she added that it was quite atrious. 
The word seemed to mean something, I do not know why. In fact, it seemed to cover the whole ground and leave nothing more to say. I admired the nice aptness and the flashing felicity of the phrase, and was filled with respect for the marvelous mind that had been able to engender it. I think less of it now. It is a noticeable fact that the intellectual coinage of dreamland often passes for more there than it would fetch here. Many a time in after years my dream sweetheart threw off golden sayings which crumbled to ashes under my pencil when I was setting them down in my notebook after breakfast. I carried her back and started over again, and all the long afternoon I bore her in my arms, miles upon miles, and it never occurred to either of us that there was anything remarkable in a youth like me being able to carry that sweet bundle around half a day without some sense of fatigue or need of rest. There are many dream-worlds, but none is so rightly and reasonably and pleasantly arranged as that one. After dark we reached a great plantation-house, and it was her home. I carried her in, and the family knew me, and I knew them, although we had not met before, and the mother asked me with ill-disguised anxiety how much twelve times fourteen was, and I said, a hundred and thirty-five, and she put it down on a piece of paper, saying it was her habit in the process of perfecting her education not to trust important particulars to her memory. And her husband was offering me a chair, but noticed that Helen was asleep, so he said it would be best not to disturb her, and he backed me softly against a wardrobe and said I could stand more easily now. Then a negro came in, bowing humbly, with his slouch hat in his hand, and asked me if I would have my measure taken. The question did not surprise me, but it confused me and worried me, and I said I should like to have advice about it. He started toward the door to call advisers, then he and the family and the lights began to grow dim, and in a few moments the place was pitch dark. But straightway there came a flood of moonlight and a gust of cold wind, and I found myself crossing a frozen lake, and my arms were empty. The wave of grief that swept through me woke me up and I was sitting at my desk in the newspaper office in San Francisco, and I noticed by the clock that I had been asleep less than two minutes, and what was of more consequence, I was twenty-nine years old. That was 1864. The next year and the year after I had momentary glimpses of my dream sweetheart, but nothing more. These are set down in my notebooks under their proper dates, but with no talks nor other particulars added which is sufficient evidence to me that there were none to add. In both of these instances there was the sudden meeting and recognition, the eager approach, then the instant disappearance, leaving the world empty and of no worth. I remember the two images quite well. In fact, I remember all the images of that spirit, and can bring them before me without help of my notebook. The habit of writing down my dreams of all sorts, while they were fresh in my mind, and then studying them, and rehearsing them, and trying to find out what the source of dreams is, and which of the two or three separate persons inhabiting us is their architect, has given me a good dream memory, a thing which is not usual with people, for few drill the dream memory, and no memory can be kept strong without that. I spent a few months in the Hawaiian Islands in 1866, and in October of that year I delivered my maiden lecture. It was in San Francisco. In the following January I arrived in New York, and had just completed my thirty-first year. In that year I saw my platonic dream sweetheart again. In this dream I was again standing on the stage of the Opera House in San Francisco, ready to lecture, and with the audience vividly individualized before me in the strong light. I began, spoke a few words, and stopped cold with fright, for I discovered that I had no subject, no text, nothing to talk about. I choked for a while, then got out a few words, a lame, poor attempt at humor. The house made no response. There was a miserable pause, then another attempt and another failure. There were a few scornful laughs. Otherwise the house was silent, unsmilingly austere, deeply offended. I was consuming with shame. In my distress I tried to work upon its pity. I began to make servile apologies mixed with gross and ill-timed flatteries, and to beg and plead for forgiveness. 
This was too much, and the people broke into insulting cries, whistlings, hootings, and catcalls, and in the midst of this they rose and began to struggle in a confused mass toward the door. I stood dazed and helpless, looking out over this spectacle, and thinking how everybody would be talking about it next day, and I could not show myself in the streets. When the house was become wholly empty and still, I sat down on the only chair that was on the stage, and bent my head down on the reading-desk to shut out the look of that place. Soon that familiar dream-voice spoke my name, and swept all my troubles away. "'Robert?' I answered. "'Agnes!' The next moment we two were lounging up the blossomy gorge called the Iao Valley in the Hawaiian Islands. I recognized, without any explanations, that Robert was not my name, but only a pet name, a common noun, and meant dear, and both of us knew that Agnes was not a name, but only a pet name, a common noun, whose spirit was affectionate, but not conveyable with exactness in any but the dream language. It was about the equivalent of dear, but the dream vocabulary shaves meanings finer and closer than do the world's daytime dictionaries. We did not know why those words should have those meanings. We had used words which had no existence in any known language, and had expected them to be understood, and they were understood. In my notebooks there are several letters from this dream sweetheart, in some unknown tongue, presumably dream tongue, with translations added. I should like to be master of that tongue, then I could talk in shorthand. Here is one of those letters, the whole of it. Rax Oha Tal Translation when you receive this, it will remind you that I long to see your face and touch your hand, for the comfort of it and the peace. It is swifter than waking thought, for thought is not thought at all, but only a vague and formless fog until it is articulated into words. We wandered far up the fairy gorge, gathering the beautiful flowers of the ginger plant, and talking affectionate things, and tying and retying each other's ribbons and cravats, which didn't need it and finally sat down in the shade of a tree, and climbed the vine-hung precipices with our eyes, up and up and up toward the sky, to where the drifting scarfs of white mist clove them across, and left the green summits floating pale and remote, like spectral islands wandering in the deeps of space. And then we descended to earth, and talked again. "'How still it is, and soft, and balmy and reposeful!' I could never tire of it. You like it, don't you, Robert?" Yes, and I like the whole region, all the islands. Maui! It is a darling island. I have been here before, have you? Once. But it wasn't an island then. What was it? It was a sufa. I understood. It was the dream word for part of a continent. What were the people like? They hadn't come yet. There weren't any. Do you know, Agnes, that is Haleakala, the dead volcano over there across the valley. Was it here in your friend's time? Yes, but it was burning. Do you travel much? I think so. Not here much, but in the stars a good deal. Is it pretty there? She used a couple of dream words for, You will go with me some time, and you will see. Noncommittal, as one perceives now, but I did not notice it then. A man-of-war bird lit on her shoulder. I put out my hand and caught it. Its feathers began to fall out, and it turned into a kitten. Then the kitten's body began to contract itself to a ball, and put out hairy, long legs, and soon it was a tarantula. I was going to keep it, but it turned into a starfish, and I threw it away. Agnes said it was not worth while to try to keep things. There was no stability about them. I suggested rocks. But she said a rock was like the rest, it wouldn't stay. She picked up a stone, and it turned into a bat and flew away. These curious matters interested me, but that was all. They did not stir my wonder. While we were sitting there in the Yao Gorge talking, a Kanaka came along who was wrinkled and bent and white-headed, and he stopped and talked to us in the native tongue, and we understood him without trouble, and answered him in his own speech. He said he was a hundred and thirty years old, and he remembered Captain Cook well, and was present when he was murdered, saw it with his own eyes, and also helped. Then he showed us his gun, 
which was of strange make, and he said it was his own invention, and was to shoot arrows with, though one loaded it with powder, and it had a percussion lock. He said it would carry a hundred miles. It seemed a reasonable statement. I had no fault to find with it, and it did not in any way surprise me. He loaded it, and fired an arrow aloft, and it darted into the sky and vanished. Then he went his way, saying that the arrow would fall near us in half an hour, and would go many yards into the earth, not minding the rocks. I took the time, and we waited, reclining upon the mossy slant at the base of a tree and gazing into the sky. By and by there was a hissing sound, followed by a dull impact, and Agnes uttered a groan. She said, in a series of fainting gasps, "'Take me to your arms. It passed through me. Hold me to your heart. I am afraid to die. Closer, closer. It is growing dark. I cannot see you. Don't leave me. Where are you? You are not gone. You will not leave me. I would not leave you.' Then her spirit passed. She was clay in my arms. The scene changed in an instant, and I was awake and crossing Bond Street in New York with a friend, and it was snowing hard. We had been talking, and there had been no observable gaps in the conversation. I doubt if I had made any more than two steps while I was asleep. I am satisfied that even the most elaborate and incident-crowded dream is seldom more than a few seconds in length. It would not cost me very much of a strain to believe in Mohammed's seventy-year dream, which began when he knocked his glass over, and ended in time for him to catch it, before the water was spilled. Within a quarter of an hour I was in my quarters, undressed, ready for bed, and was jotting down my dream in my notebook. A striking thing happened now. I finished my notes, and was just going to turn out the gas when I was caught with a most strenuous gape for it was very late and I was very drowsy. I fell asleep and dreamed again. What now follows occurred while I was asleep, and when I woke again the gape had completed itself, but not long before, I think, for I was still on my feet. I was in Athens, a city which I had not then seen, but I recognized the Parthenon from the pictures, although it had a fresh look and was in perfect repair. I passed by it and climbed a grassy hill toward a palatial sort of mansion which was built of red terracotta and had a spacious portico whose roof was supported by a rank of fluted columns with Corinthian capitals. It was noonday, but I met no one. I passed into the house and entered the first room. It was very large and light. Its walls were of polished and richly tinted and veined onyx, and its floor was a pictured pattern in soft colors laid in tiles. I noted the details of the furniture and the ornaments, a thing which I should not have been likely to do when awake, and they took sharp hold and remained in my memory. They are not really dim yet, and this was more than thirty years ago. There was a person present, Agnes. I was not surprised to see her, but only glad. She was in the simple Greek costume, and her hair and eyes were different as to color from those she had had when she died in the Hawaiian Islands half an hour before. But to me she was exactly her own beautiful little self, as I had always known her, and she was still fifteen, and I was seventeen once more. She was sitting on an ivory settee, crocheting something or other, and had her crewels in a shallow willow work-basket in her lap. I sat down by her, and we began to chat in the usual way. I remembered her death, but the pain and the grief and the bitterness which had been so sharp and so desolating to me at the moment that it happened had wholly passed from me now, and had left not a scar. I was grateful to have her back, but there was no realizable sense that she had ever been gone, and so it did not occur to me to speak about it and she made no reference to it herself. It may be that she had often died before, and knew that there was nothing lasting about it, and consequently nothing important enough in it to make conversation out of. When I think of that house and its belongings, I recognize what a master in taste and drawing and color and arrangement is the dream artist who resides in us. In my waking hours, when the inferior artist in me is in command, I cannot draw even the simplest picture with a pencil, nor do anything with a brush and colors. I cannot bring before my mind's eye the detailed image of any building known to me except my own house at home, of St. Paul's, St. Peter's, the Eiffel Tower, the Taj, the Capitol at Washington, 
i can reproduce only portions partial glimpses the same with niagara falls the matterhorn and other familiar things in nature i cannot bring before my mind's eye the face or figure of any human being known to me i have seen my family at breakfast within the past two hours i cannot bring their images before me i do not know how they look before me as i write i see a little grove of young trees in the garden high above them projects the slender lance of a young pine beyond it is a glimpse of the upper half of a dull white chimney covered by an a-shaped little roof shingled with brown-red tiles and a half a mile away is a hilltop densely wooded and the red is cloven by a curved wide vacancy which is smooth and grass-clad i cannot shut my eyes and reproduce that picture as a whole at all nor any single detail of it except the grassy curve and that but vaguely and fleetingly but my dream artist can draw anything and do it perfectly he can paint with all the colors and all the shades and do it with delicacy and truth he can place before me vivid images of palaces cities hamlets hovels mountains valleys lakes skies glowing in sunlight or moonlight or veiled in driving gusts of snow or rain and he can set before me people who are intensely alive and who feel and express their feelings in their faces and who also talk and laugh sing and swear and when i wake i can shut my eyes and bring back those people and the scenery and the buildings and not only in general view but often in nice detail while agnes and i sat talking in that grand athens house several stately greeks entered from another part of it disputing warmly about something or other and passed us by with courteous recognition and among them was socrates i recognized him by his nose a moment later the house and agnes and athens vanished away and i was in my quarters in new york again and reaching for my notebook in our dreams i know it we do make the journeys we seem to make we do see the things we seem to see the people the horses the cats the dogs the birds the whales are real not chimeras they are living spirits not shadows and they are immortal and indestructible they go whither they will they visit all resorts all points of interest even the twinkling suns that wander in the wastes of space that is where those strange mountains are which slide from under our feet while we walk and where those vast caverns are whose bewildering avenues close behind us and in front when we are lost and shut us in we know this because there are no such things here and they must be there because there is no other place this tale is long enough and i will close it now in the forty-four years that i have known my dreamland sweetheart I have seen her once in two years on an average. Mainly these were glimpses, but she was always immediately recognizable, notwithstanding she was so given to repairing herself and getting up doubtful improvements in her hair and eyes. She was always fifteen, and looked it and acted it, and I was always seventeen, and never felt a day older. To me she is a real person, not a fiction and her sweet and innocent society has been one of the prettiest and pleasantest experiences of my life i know that to you her talk will not seem of the first intellectual order but you should hear her in dreamland then you would see i saw her a week ago just for a moment fifteen as usual and i seventeen instead of going on sixty-three as i was when i went to sleep we were in india and bombay was in sight also windsor castle its towers and battlements veiled in a delicate haze and from it the thames flowed curving and winding between its swarded banks to our feet i said there is no question about it england is the most beautiful of all the countries her face lighted with approval and she said with that sweet and earnest irrelevance of hers it is because it is so marginal then she disappeared it was just as well she could probably have added nothing to that rounded and perfect statement without damaging its symmetry this glimpse of her carries me back to maui and that time when i saw her gasp out her young life that was a terrible thing to me at the time it was preternaturally vivid 
and the pain and the grief and the misery of it to me transcended many sufferings that I have known in waking life. For everything in a dream is more deep and strong and sharp and real than is ever its pale imitation in the unreal life which is ours when we go about awake and clothed with our artificial selves in this vague and dull-tinted artificial world. When we die, we shall slough off this cheap intellect, perhaps, and go abroad into dreamland, clothed in our real selves, and aggrandized and enriched by the command over the mysterious mental magician who is here not our slave, but only our guest. End of My Platonic Sweetheart by Mark Twain this is John Greenman. A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Davis Drake Little Miss Summers one day found herself the unexpected possessor of fifteen dollars. It seemed to her a very large amount of money, and the way in which it stuffed and bulged her worn old portemonnaie gave her a feeling of importance such as she had not enjoyed for years. The question of investment was one that occupied her greatly. For a day or two she walked about apparently in a dreamy state, but really absorbed in speculation and calculation. She did not wish to act hastily, to do anything she might afterward regret. But it was during the still hours of the night, when she lay awake revolving plans in her mind, that she seemed to see her way clearly towards a proper and judicious use of the money. A dollar or two should be added to the price usually paid for Janie's shoes, which would ensure their lasting an appreciable time longer than they usually did. She would buy so and so many yards of per cow for new shirt waists for the boys and Janie and Mag. She had intended to make the old ones do by skillful patching. Mag should have another gown. She had seen some beautiful patterns, veritable bargains in the shop windows and still there would be left enough for new stockings, two pairs apiece, and what darning that would save for a while. She would get caps for the boys and sailor hats for the girls. The vision of her little brood looking fresh and dainty and new for once in their lives excited her and made her restless and wakeful with anticipation. The neighbors sometimes talked of certain better days that little Mrs. Summers had known before she had ever thought of being Mrs. Summers. She herself indulged in no such morbid retrospection. She had no time, no second of time to devote to the past. The needs of the present absorbed her every facility. A vision of the future like some dim, gaunt monster sometimes appalled her, but luckily tomorrow never comes. Mrs. Summers was one who knew the value of bargains, who could stand for hours, making her way inch by inch towards the desired object that was selling below cost. She could elbow her way if need be. She had learned to clutch a piece of goods and hold it and stick to it with persistence and determination, till her turn came to be served, no matter when it came. But that day she was a little faint and tired. She had swallowed a light luncheon. No. When she came to think of it, between getting the children fed and the place righted, and preparing herself for the shopping bout, she had actually forgotten to eat any luncheon at all. She sat herself upon a revolving stool before a counter that was comparatively deserted, trying to gather strength and courage to charge through an eager multitude that was besieging breastworks of shirting and figured lawn. An all-gone limp feeling had come over her, and she rested her head aimlessly upon the counter. She wore no gloves. By degrees she grew aware that her hand had encountered something very soothing, very pleasant to the touch. She looked down to see her hand lay upon a pile of silk stockings. 
a placard nearby announced that they had been reduced in price from two dollars and fifty cents to one dollar and ninety-eight cents and a young girl who stood behind the counter asked her if she wished to examine their line of silk hosiery she smiled just as if she had been asked to inspect the tiara of diamonds with the ultimate view of purchasing them but she went on feeling the soft sheeny luxurious things with both hands now holding them up to see them glisten and to feel them glide serpent-like through her fingers two hectic blotches suddenly came into her pale cheeks she looked up at the girl do you think there are any eights and a half among these there were any number of eights and a half in fact there were more of that size than any other here was a light blue pair there were some lavender some all black and various shades of tan and gray mrs summers selected a black pair and looked at them very long and closely she pretended to be examining their texture which the clerk assured her was excellent a dollar and ninety-eight cents she mused aloud well i'll take this pair she handed the girl a five-dollar bill and waited for her change and for her parcel what a very small parcel it was it seemed lost in the depths of her shabby old shopping bag mrs summers after that did not move in the direction of the bargain counter she took the elevator which carried her to an upper floor into the region of the ladies waiting rooms here in a retired corner she exchanged her cotton stockings for the new silk ones which she had just bought she was not going through any acute mental process or reasoning with herself nor was she striving to explain to her satisfaction the motive of her action she was not thinking at all she seemed for a time to be taking a rest from that laborious and fatiguing function and to abandon herself to some mechanical impulse that directed her actions and freed her of responsibility how good was the touch of the raw silk to her flesh she felt like lying back in the cushioned chair and reveling for a while in the luxury of it she did for a little while then she replaced her shoes rolled the cotton stockings together and thrust them into her bag after doing this she crossed straight over to the shoe department and took her seat to be fitted she was fastidious the clerk could not make her out he could not reconcile her shoes with her stockings and she was not too easily pleased she held back her skirts and turned her feet one way and her head another way as she glanced down to the polished pointed tipped boots her foot and ankle looked very pretty she could not realize that they belonged to her and were a part of her she wanted an excellent and stylish fit she told the young fellow who served her and she did not mind the difference of a dollar or two more in the price so long as she got what she desired it was a long time since mrs summers had been fitted with gloves on rare occasions when she had bought a pair they were always bargains so cheap that it would have been preposterous and unreasonable to have expected them to be fitted to the hand now she rested her elbow on the cushion of the glove counter and a pretty pleasant young creature delicate and deft of touch drew a long-wristed kid over mrs summer's hand she smoothed it down over the wrist and buttoned it neatly and both lost themselves for a second or two in admiring contemplation of the little symmetrically gloved hand but there were other places where money might be spent there were books and magazines piled up in the window of a stall a few paces down the street mrs summers bought two high-priced magazines such as she had been accustomed to read in the days when she had been accustomed to other pleasant things she carried them without wrapping as well as she could she lifted her skirts at the crossings her stockings and boots and well-fitted gloves had worked marvels in her bearing had given her a feeling of assurance a sense of belonging to the well-dressed multitude she was very hungry at other times she would have stilled the cravings for food until she reached her own home where she would have brewed herself a cup of tea 
and taken a snack of anything that was available but the impulse that was guiding her would not suffer her to entertain any such thought there was a restaurant on the corner she had never entered its doors from the outside she had sometimes caught glimpses of spotless damask and shining crystal and soft stepping waiters serving people of fashion when she entered her appearance created no surprise no consternation as she had half feared it might she seated herself at a small table alone and an attentive waiter at once approached to take her order she did not want a profusion she craved a nice and tasty bite a half dozen blue points a plump chop with cress and something sweet a creme frappe for instance a glass of rhine wine and after all a small cup of black coffee while waiting to be served she removed her gloves very leisurely and laid them beside her then she picked up a magazine and glanced through it cutting the pages with the blunt edge of her knife it was all very agreeable the damask was even more spotless than it had seemed through the window and the crystal more sparkling there were quiet ladies and gentlemen who did not notice her lunching at the small tables like her own a soft pleasing strain of music could be heard a gentle breeze was blowing through the window she tasted a bite and she read a word or two and she sipped the amber wine and wiggled her toes in the silk stockings the price of it made no difference she counted the money out to the waiter and left an extra coin on his tray whereupon he bowed before her as before a princess of royal blood there was still money in her purse and her next temptation presented itself in the shape of a matinee poster it was a little later when she entered the theater the play had begun and the house seemed to her to be packed but there were vacant seats here and there and into one of them she was ushered between brilliantly dressed women who had gone there to kill time and eat candy and display their gaudy attire there were many others who were there solely for the play and acting it is safe to say that there is no one present who bore quite the attitude which mrs somers did to her surroundings she gathered in the whole stage and players and people in one wide impression and absorbed it and enjoyed it she laughed at the comedy and wept and she and the gaudy woman next to her wept over the tragedy and they talked a little together over it and the gaudy woman wiped her eyes and sniffed on a tiny square of flimsy perfumed lace and passed mrs somers her box of candy the play was over the music ceased the crowd filed out it was like a dream ended people scattered in all directions mrs somers went to the corner and waited for the cable car a man with keen eyes who sat opposite her seemed to like the study of her small pale face it puzzled him to decipher what he saw there in truth he saw nothing unless he were wizard enough to detect a poignant wish a powerful longing that the cable car would never stop anywhere but would go on and on with her forever end of a pair of silk stockings by kate chopin this recording is in the public domain read by alan davis drake A Tent in Agony by Stephen Crane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four men once came to a wet place in the roadless forest to fish. They pitched their tent fair upon the brow of a pine clothed rim of riven rocks whence a boulder could be made to crash through the brush and whirl past the trees to the lake below on fragrant hemlock boughs they slept the sleep of unsuccessful fishermen for upon the lake alternately the sun made them lazy and the rain made them wet 
finally they ate the last bit of bacon and smoked and burned the last fearful and wonderful hoe cake immediately a little man volunteered to stay and hold the camp while the remaining three should go to the sullivan county miles to a farmhouse for supplies they gazed at him dismally there's only one of you the devil make a twin they said in parting malediction and disappeared down the hill in the known direction of a distant cabin when it came night and the hemlocks began to sob they had not returned the little man sat close to his companion the campfire and encouraged it with logs he puffed fiercely at a heavy built briar and regarded a thousand shadows which were about to assault him suddenly he heard the approach of the unknown crackling the twigs and rustling the dead leaves the little man arose slowly to his feet his clothes refused to fit his back his pipe dropped from his mouth his knees smote each other ah! he bellowed hoarsely in menace a growl replied and a bear paced into the light of the fire the little man supported himself upon a sapling and regarded his visitor the bear was evidently a veteran and a fighter for the back of his coat had become tawny with age there was confidence in his gait and arrogance in his small twinkling eye he rolled back his lips and disclosed his white teeth the fire magnified the red of his mouth the little man had never before confronted the terrible and he could not wrest it from his breast ah he roared the bear interpreted this as the challenge of a gladiator he approached warily as he came nearer the boots of fear were suddenly upon the little man's feet he cried out and then departed around the campfire ho said the bear to himself this thing won't fight it runs well suppose i catch it so upon his features there fixed the animal look of going somewhere he started intensely around the campfire the little man shrieked and ran furiously twice around they went the hand of heaven sometimes falls heavily upon the righteous the bear gained in desperation the little man flew into the tent the bear stopped and sniffed at the entrance he scented the scent of many men finally he ventured in the little man crouched in a distant corner the bear advanced creeping his blood burning his hair erect his jowls dripping the little man yelled and rustled clumsily under the flap at the end of the tent the bear snarled awfully and made a jump and a grab at its disappearing game the little man, now without the tent, felt a tremendous paw grab his coat-tails. He squirmed and wriggled out of his coat, like a schoolboy in the hands of an avenger. The bear howled triumphantly and jerked the coat into the tent, and took two bites, a punch, and a hug, before he discovered his man was not in it. Then he grew not very angry, for a bear on a spree is not a black-haired pirate. He is merely a hoodlum. He lay down upon his back, took the coat on his four paws, and began to play uproariously with it. The most appalling, blood curdling whoops and yells came to where the little man was crying in a treetop and froze his blood. He moaned a little speech meant for a prayer and clung convulsively to the bending branches. He gazed with tearful wistfulness at where his comrade, the campfire, was giving dying flickers and crackles. Finally there was a roar from the tent which eclipsed all roars, a snarl which it seemed would shake the solid silence of the mountains and cause it to shrug its granite shoulders. The little man quaked and shriveled to a grip in a pair of eyes. In the glow of the embers he saw the white tent quiver and fall with a crash. The bear's merry play had disturbed the center pole, and brought a chaos of canvas about his head. Now the little man became the witness of a mighty scene. The tent began to flounder. It took flopping strides in the direction of the lake. 
Marvelous sounds came from within, rips and tears and great groans and pants. The little man went into giggling hysterics. The entangled monster failed to extricate himself before he had frenziedly walloped the tent to the edge of the mountain. So it came to pass that three men clambering up the hill with bundles and baskets saw their tent approaching. It seemed to them like a white-robed phantom, pursued by hornets. Its moans riffled the hemlock twigs. The three men dropped their bundles and scurried to one side, their eyes gleaming with fear. The canvas avalanche swept past them. They leaned, faint and dumb, against the trees and listened, their blood stagnant. Below them it struck the base of a great pine tree, where it writhed and struggled. The three watched its convolutions a moment and then started terrifically for the top of the hill. As they disappeared, the bear cut loose with a mighty effort. He cast one disheveled and agonized look at the white thing, and then started wildly for the inner recesses of the forest. The three fear-stricken individuals ran to the rebuilt fire. The little man reposed by it, calmly smoking. They sprang at him and overwhelmed him with interrogations. He contemplated darkness and took a long, pompous puff. There's only one of me, and the devil made a twin, he said. End of A Tent in Agony by Stephen Crane Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake This recording is in the public domain. The White Snake by Brothers Grimm From Grimm's Fairy Tales Translated by Edgar Taylor Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake A long time ago there lived a king who was famed for his wisdom through all the land. Nothing was hidden from him, and it seemed as if news of the most secret things were brought to him through the air. But he had a strange custom. Every day after dinner, when the table was cleared, and no one else was present, a trusty servant had to bring him one more dish. It was covered, however, and even the servant did not know what was in it. Neither did anyone know, for the king never took off the cover to eat of it until he was quite alone. This had gone on for a long time, when one day the servant, who took away the dish, was overcome with such curiosity that he could not help carrying the dish into his room. When he had carefully locked the door, he lifted up the cover and saw a white snake lying on the dish. But when he saw it, he could not deny himself the pleasure of tasting it. So he cut out a little bit and put it into his mouth. No sooner had it touched his tongue than he heard a strange whispering of little voices outside his window. He went and listened and then noticed that it was the sparrows who were chattering together, and telling one another of all kinds of things which they had seen in the fields and woods. Eating the snake had given him power of understanding the language of animals. Now it so happened that on this very day the queen lost her most beautiful ring, and suspicion of having stolen it fell upon this trusty servant, who was allowed to go anywhere. The king ordered the man to be brought before him, and threatened with angry words that unless he could before the morrow point out the thief, he himself would be looked upon as guilty and executed. In vain he declared his innocence. He was dismissed with no better answer. In his trouble and fear, he went down to the courtyard and took thought how to help himself out of his trouble. Now some ducks were sitting together quietly by a brook and taking their rest, and whilst they were making their feathers smooth with their bills, they were having a confidential conversation together. The servants stood by and listened. They were telling one another of all the places where they had been waddling about all the morning, and what good food they had found, and one said in a pitiful tone, 
something lies heavy on my stomach. As I was eating in haste, I swallowed a ring which lay under the queen's window. The servant at once seized her by the neck, carried her to the kitchen, and said to the cook, Here is a fine duck, pray, kill her. Yes, said the cook, and weighed her in his hand. She has spared no trouble to fatten herself, and has been waiting to be roasted long enough. So he cut off her head, and as she was being dressed for the spit, the queen's ring was found inside her. The servant could now easily prove his innocence, and the king, to make his amends for the wrong, allowed him to ask a favor, and promised him the best place in the court that he could wish for. The servant refused everything, and only asked for a horse and some money for traveling as he had a mind to see the world and go about a little. When his request was granted, he set out on his way, and one day came to a pond where he saw three fishes caught in the reeds, and gasping for water. Now, though it is said that fishes are dumb, he heard them lamenting that they must perish so miserably, and, as he had a kind heart, he got off his horse and put the three prisoners back into the water. They leapt with delight, put out their heads, and cried to him, We will remember you and repay you for saving us. He rode on, and after a while it seemed to him that he heard a voice in the sand at his feet. He listened, and heard an ant-king complain, Why cannot folks, with their clumsy beasts, keep off our bodies? That stupid horse with his heavy hooves has been treading down my people without mercy. So he turned on to a side path, and the ant king cried out to him, We will remember you. One good turn deserves another. The path led him into a wood, and there he saw two old ravens standing by their nest, and throwing out their young ones. Out with you, you idle good-for-nothing creatures, they cried. We cannot find food for you any longer. You are big enough and can provide for yourselves. But the poor young ravens lay upon the ground, flapping their wings and crying, Oh, what helpless chicks we are! We must shift for ourselves, and yet we cannot fly. What can we do but lie here and starve? So the good young fellow alighted and killed his horse with his sword, and gave it to them for food. Then they came hopping up to it, satisfied their hunger, and cried, We will remember you. One good turn deserves another. And now he had to use his own legs, and when he had walked a long way, he came to a large city. There was a great noise and crowd in the streets, and a man rode up on horseback, crying, The king's daughter wants a husband, but whoever seeks her hand must perform a hard task, and if he does not succeed, he will forfeit his life. Many had already made the attempt, but in vain. Nevertheless, when the youth saw the king's daughter, he was so overcome by her great beauty that he forgot all danger, went before the king, and declared himself a suitor. So he was led out to the sea, and a gold ring was thrown into it before his eyes. Then the king ordered him to fetch this ring from the bottom of the sea, and added, If you come up again without it, you will be thrown in again and again, until you perish amid the waves. All the people grieved for the handsome youth. Then they went away, leaving him alone by the sea. He stood on the shore and considered what he should do, when suddenly he saw three fishes coming swimming towards him, and they were the very fishes whose lives he had saved. The one in the middle held a mussel in his mouth, which had laid on the shore at the youth's feet. And when he had taken it up and opened it, there lay the gold ring in the shell. Full of joy, he took it to the king and expected that he would grant him the promised reward. But when the proud princess perceived that he was not her equal in birth, she scorned him and required him first to perform another task. She went down into the garden and strewed with her hands ten sackfuls of millet seed in the grass. Then she said, 
to-morrow morning before sunrise these must be picked up and not a single grain be wanting the youth sat down in the garden and considered how it might be possible to perform this task but he could think of nothing and there he sat sorrowfully awaiting the break of day when he should be led to death but as soon as the first rays of the sun shone into the garden he saw all the ten sacks standing side by side quite full and not a single grain was missing the ant king had come in the night with thousands and thousands of ants and the grateful creatures had by great industry picked up all the millet seed and gathered them into the sacks presently the king's daughter herself came down into the garden and was amazed to see that the young man had done the task she had given him but she could not yet conquer her proud heart and said although he has performed both the tasks he shall not be my husband until he has brought me an apple from the tree of life the youth did not know where the tree of life stood but he set out and would have gone on forever as long as his legs would carry him though he had no hope of finding it after he had wandered through three kingdoms he came one evening to a wood and lay down under a tree to sleep but he heard a rustling in the branches and a golden apple fell into his hand at the same time three ravens flew down to him perched themselves upon his knee and said we are the three young ravens whom you saved from starving when we had grown up we heard that you were seeking the golden apple we flew over the sea to the end of the world where the tree of life stands and have brought you the apple the youth full of joy set out homeward and took the golden apple to the king's beautiful daughter who had now no more excuses left to make they cut the apple of life in two and ate it together and then her heart became full of love for him and they lived in undisturbed happiness to a great age end of the white snake by brothers grimm read for LibriVox.org by alan davis drake this recording is in the public domain.